Well, our first speaker is Sheena Sen, um, and she is going to be talking about uh, chromosome length assemblies, a uh, bunch of genomes she's been working on, uh, followed by a bunch of very other interesting talks. Please take it away. Hi, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes. And see my screen? Uh-huh. Okay, perfect. Hi there. Thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to share some of this work with you that we're doing on fruit fly genome assemblies at the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Uh, so at our research center, one of our main areas of research are um, tefritted fruit flies. This is because they represent a family of insects that are highly invasive and destructive agricultural pests. They are largely managed using integrated pest management techniques such as powerful lures, male annihilation, insecticides, quarantine efforts, and the main method that my research program is mostly focused on is a sterile insect technique. So very briefly, the sterile insect technique is a technique in which um, uh, SA, an SIT program creates sterile male flies, usually through irradiation, and those flies are released amongst a wild population, and if a love connection is made, this will result in females that do not produce offspring and an eradicated or uh, suppressed wild population. So this process is facilitated by a genetic sexing strain, where males and females are separated by a selectable phenotype, and in all this uh, genetic sexing strains we work on, sex linkage is caused by an artificially ba or induced balanced chromosomal inversion that happened between an autosome and the Y chromosome, which fixes males in a heterozygous state uh, at a genetic sexing locus, which confers a phenotype different um, from that of females. It's because of these reciprocal translocations that we're interested in pursuing chromosome scale genome assemblies to identify structural variants for the purpose of creating new genetic sexing strains in other species. The species I'll be presenting um, the chromosome scale genomes of today are the melon fly, Zygodacus cucurbitae, the West Indian fruit fly, Anastrophe obliqua, and the Mexican fruit fly, Anastrophe ludens. All of these are very destructive pests attacking cucurbits, mangoes, and citrus respectively. So the two Anastrophe genomes that I'll be talking about were sequenced as part of the Ag 100 Pests Initiative. Uh, we're sequencing, you guessed it, 100 insect pest genomes. Um, you can track our progress on sequencing these genomes um, through this uh, QR code here. And if you want to learn more about this uh, project, Scott Guy will be presenting at around this time on Thursday. Okay. So for the first of these three species, first let me take you back to the year 2015. And um, the melon fly was sequenced using an insert library made from one individual and some, male, um, and some pa mate paired libraries. The genome was assembled into contigs and then scaffolded using the all-pass uh, LG pipeline. And this scaffold assembly was then assembled into linkage groups using use genome-wide SNPs sequenced from five mapping populations so that we could do a QTL analysis. Altogether, this required about three lanes of Illumina HiSeq um, and a lot of, or uh, many hundreds of flies that died in the process. So this is the resulting linkage map that represented um, the five autosomes of the species that we published with the genome in 2017. And the way to visualize this assembly is using this assembly stats plot. This is where the whole genome is represented by the circle. Every arc of the circle represents one piece ordered from largest to smallest. So you could see this assembly is made up of, where are you, um, you know, five large pieces and then it drops off uh, due to a lot of unplaced contigs or scaffolds. The radius of the, um, of the length, it, the radius is the length of the largest piece, and in this case, uh, a 60 megabase super scaffold. This shows its completeness over here um, in terms of the proportions of blue scores that can be found in the genome. And there's a lot of other statistics here too that we'll refer back to in a second. What the main message of this is that, uh, that I'd like you to take away from this plot is that yes, a genome is in a chromosomal context, but it's made up of tens of thousands of contigs. As you can see here, there's about 43,000 contigs. So in this case, I'm a bit of a liar. Uh, this isn't really a chromosome assembly, and it wasn't nearly as easy as to produce just by adding DNA. 
I'm sorry for lying to you, but it did get you to come to my talk. So I know 2015 was a simpler time, better year, status of the world was a little bit brighter, but sequencing and assembly technology weren't nearly as good as it is now. If we have anything in 2020, it's that we have better sequencing and assembly technology. So if we fast forward to present day, the obliqua genome was sequenced from one male used to create a PacBio HiFi library sequence on two cells of an, a PacBio SQL2. This is a method that uses circular consensus sequencing to produce high quality long reads. The sequences were assembled using HiFi ASM and the assembly stats plot shows that it's a really, really good genome, um, you know, for our purposes. If uh, you want, what you want is a genome that's highly contiguous and complete, this is what we achieved. If we compare it to the melon fly genome, we can see a lot of differences. The melon fly genome uh, represents a contig assembly that has been scaffolded and super scaffolded using uh, linkage information to place its contigs in a chromosomal context. The obliqua assembly or genome is a contig assembly that's already in a chromosomal context with its largest con TIG at about 173 megabases, which represents uh, one fifth the size of its whole genome and about the size of what you would expect in a, a, a chromosome to be in a genome of this size. So here you have 90% of the genome in these 12 contigs, <laughs> um, in contrast to this where you have 66 or 68% of the genome in 10,000 contigs and 90% in about 23,000 contigs. So lastly, because the obliqua genome is a contig assembly, uh, there are no gaps and the long read sequencing technology was able to capture and assemble the AT rich regions that are missing in the melon fly assembly. So as you can see here, there's basic, oh, sorry. Um, uh, no difference in GC content between these two genomes, but a big difference in the AT content, and that's largely because of these missing pieces. All right, so the methods for creating the MEXFLY assembly were similar to that of Obliqua, except this library was created from the thorax of just one individual. So because of this thrifty usage of insect tissue, the other parts of the fly could be used for uh, scaffolding techniques such as high C or optical mapping. And for the most part, the MEXFLY genome was very similar. It has about the same genome size as, and was assembled to about half as many contigs, but it has a slightly smaller N50 and N90. So now it's one thing to assemble genomes to a chromosome scale using long read information just from one individual, but how do we know how accurate it is? So to validate our assemblies, we're relying on the conservation of molar elements in Diptera by performing an analysis for syntony. So in that 2017 publication, we reported a high level of syntony between melon fly linkage groups and Drosophila chromosome arms slash molar elements. Each of these lines represents one of the genes in the Busco Diptera data sets. As you can see that you can easily identify which of the melon fly linkage groups are homologous to which Drosophila chromosome arms. We know on our old melon fly assembly, um, it was uh, assembled good enough to be able to um, identify these these um, molar elements because all the right genes are in this right package. So when you make the same plot for obliqua and Drosophila, you see a similar pattern, which is a high conservation of these molar elements. So even though we see a high conservation of uh, gene composition in these molar elements, collinearity between Drosophilids and Tephridids appears to have decayed over the 150 million years since they last shared a common ancestor. The scatter plot represents the start position of each of these buscos found in molar element D or Drosophila chromosome arm 3L. Uh, this um, versus, so Drosophila on the y-axis, um, obliqua on the x-axis. And so when you plot those, the, those two starting position, you can I look for the relationship between where the gene is in Drosophila versus where it is in Obliqua, and there's not a whole lot of collinearity here. I mean, I guess you can kind of squint, maybe see a line like going this way, but I, I think that's a bit of a stretch. So now when you start to compare tephridids with each other, you start to see a lot more collinearity. Um, however, because like I said, I'm a liar, these five uh, bars right here don't actually represent contigs, unlike these 10 bars up here. 
So these represent tens of thousands of contexts, but have been assembled in these, this chromosomal context. Okay. So um, the size of these bars is also a lie <laughs> because uh, the way of the, that it's scaled, this is actually 173 megabases where this is only 60, but that's also just reflective of the sizes of the genomes. Okay, so the scatter plot for oblique oil versus melon fly shows that there's actually a lot more um, regions of collinear genes. So obliqua and melon fly had a common ancestor as recently as 120 million years ago, so 30 million more recently than obliqua and drosophila. So this makes a lot of sense. Because of the method by which we assembled the, this melon, the melon fly chromosome, um, there were many scaffolds that couldn't be, that could be ordered but not oriented. So some of what looked like inversions could be just because a program guessed the wrong orientation, like here, here and these small pieces. Most of the Diptera buscos um, in the uh, Anastrefa assemblies were found in these 12 contigs ooh, on Mexfly and 10 contigs in Obliqua. So this demonstrates that the contigs in this assembly are in fact at a near chromosome scale, like in Obliqua 3L, 3R, and then X here, it looks like it's in two pieces, but maybe separated because the, the assembler couldn't uh, sequence across the centromere. Oh, it's also important to note that this says it's X because that's what it's homologous to in Drosophila, but that's the X chromosome in Drosophila is an autosome in Tifridids. So by plotting these boosts, oh, sorry, uh, by plotting these boost goes between um, these two closely related Anastrafa species, we're able to potentially detect inversions as well. And so there's one right here where you see this little twist between these two uh, contigs. Um, and we also see interchromosomal um, translocations. Uh, there's also things that may look like inversions, but it's likely just the way the assembly is indexed. So you can imagine that if, um, for example, in this contig, if it had um, been indexed zero at this side, you wouldn't see this twist here and it wouldn't look like an inversion. So that's not, that just looks like something that it might not really be. Um, and if you untwisted it, it would look completely collinear. So when the plot, um, when you plot those same boosts goes on, you know, a scatter plot like this, what you see is a very strong collinear relationship between the genes in these contigs, say for this one region that might be indicative of um, in chromosomal inversion. So there's also a region here that is suspiciously devoid of BUSCO genes that's all indicative of a gene poor centromeric region. When you look at the GC content of the five prime ends of both of these contigs for an, uh, obliqua and ludens, what you see is these um, elevated GC regions, um, which is uh, indicative of the heterochromatic sequences, which might be um, point us towards the fact that these um, are the beginnings of chromosomes, so like the telomeric regions of chromosomes. But uh, further validation is needed to test these hypotheses. Right now, we're confident in these sequencing and assembly tools and methods that can help us further in this, further this investigation. Okay, so in summary, um, because of our interest in the genetic sexing strains and chromosome, uh, chromosomal translocations that they harbor, we've been developing methods to achieve chromosome scale assemblies. This was achieved previously by using many different library types and mapping information, which yielded a very good assembly that could be placed in a chromosomal context with still about 43,000 contexts. Now we can uh, create a high five pack bio library from one fly thorax and get back an assembly that's only in 211 contiguous pieces with the contexts already representing chromosomes or chromosome arms without any additional scaffolding necessary. We compared these two species um, and exploited the conservation of molar elements in diptera to validate the assemblies to each other. And uh, when you look at the last, uh, the two largest homologous contexts between the two Anastrefa assemblies, we see a large amount of collinearity, which indicates the accuracy of both of these assemblies. And hints at we've captured a telomeric and some of the, or so, tel the centromeric and some of the telomeric regions which indicates that we're approaching a telomere to telomere assembly for these chromosomes. Okay, so I have about a minute. Thank you all for listening. Um, I'd like to thank our funding sources, ARS, APHIS, and NIFA 
um, who, and all the people who did the real work, who are Scott and his group, who did the library prep and assembly, Brian Scheffler and his group at the GBRU in Stoneville, Mississippi. Um, the HPC cluster where we did all of our uh, data analysis and Anna Childers and the Ag 100 Pest Initiative. Oh, and of course our collaborators who sent us samples because we don't have Anna Strafe in Hawaii. Thank you very much, Shana. Uh, if you can answer this question very, very quickly, then we can have one quick question. Do you have a feeling uh, for what special biology of a given species kind of makes it easier to get a good assembly? You know, I used to think that, that there were some genes that, or some species that were a lot harder to assemble than others. Like Anastrafa ludens was a very difficult one. We've been trying for years. Um, so I think it's more the library type and the library prep than it is the, the, the species, because like I said, that was a very difficult species to assemble or genome to assemble for us that did not, um, that ended up very good in this time and very poorly others. So I don't know if it's a species thing, but if I had to guess, it might be repeat content. <laughs> thank you. Surya, go ahead. All right, thank you so much for that excellent talk, Sheena. Uh, I think this was a nice example of showing what highly co contiguous uh, long range assemblies can allow in terms of uh, doing structural comparisons. So uh, since we are running right on time, uh, let's just quickly go on over to Tom, who will talk to us about his beautiful avid genomes. Okay, great. And we can see your screen, Tom. Brilliant, thank you very much. So I actually, um, I presented my, my first arthropod genomic symposium uh, two years ago, and, and it, I have to say it was one of the nicest and most um, enjoyable conferences experiences that I've had. So it's really great to be able to take part in this uh, online version of the conference uh, and give you an update on our progress, understanding the, the macro evolution of, of aphid genome structure with new uh, chromosome level genome assemblies. So most of what we know about uh, insect genome structure and, and evolution is based on studies of model Lep Lepidoptera and Diptera. And these are typified by very high levels of, or typically high levels of syntony, um, where, for example, in mosquitoes, as I show here, uh, whole chromosome arms are conserved over around 150 million years of evolution. And in Lepidoptera, although there are some very uh, dramatic exceptions to this rule, uh, the majority, or, the, or certainly the model species within Lepidoptera, have um, very high levels of syntony conserved over very long periods of time. However, um, across insects as a whole, uh, chromosome number is actually highly variable. Uh, and so by just focusing on these few model systems, we're really missing the, the great diversity of, of chromosome evolution that's out there within and across insects. So for example, within Hemiptera, which are the insects we're interested in, chromosome number can vary from two, a diploid number of two to 192. So there's really quite striking differences um, that can be found. And of course, there's lots of cool things going on that we can only look at now. We can quickly and easily assemble high quality or relatively easily assemble high quality chromosome level assemblies with long reads and other scaffolding technologies. So I'm going to take a couple of slides to try and persuade you why I think aphids are a great system to look at chromosome evolution in insects. So they have an unusual chromosome structure. So most people would be familiar with uh, species with monocentric chromosomes. This is where, uh, um, where species have chromosomes which contain centromeres where the spindle fibers attach in mitosis and meiosis uh, and they're localized within either the middle of a chromosome or the end of a chromosome. However, in aphids, they have holocentric chromosomes and other hemiptera as well. They have holocentric chromosomes where there's no localized centromeres and spindle fibers can attach diffusely across the chromosomes. They also show, as I alluded to in the earlier slide, they have quite high variation in chromosome number. So here I've shown a phylogeny of 20 or so aphid genomes that we've been working on. And um, these are from two aphid tribes, the Macrosophini and the Aphidini. And within these two tribes, these genomes I show here, the chromosome number varies from 2n is 8 to 2n equals 18. So between four and nine chromosomes. And actually across aphids as a whole, chromosome number can vary from two to 72. So there's very high variation over relatively short periods of evolutionary time. 
and the chromosome number can also vary both with it as well as varying between species chromosome number can also vary within species as well so this is an example of some uh, populations of mysis persicae the green peach aphid where um, different populations have different carrier types where there's breaks in the x chromosome or one of the other chromosomes in one of the autosomes and some of this variation is associated with adaptive evolution as well so some um, chromosome rearrangement in Mises persicae, for example, have been associated with the evolution of insecticide resistance. They also have this great life cycle, which is really fascinating. So aphids throughout the spring and summer reproduce predominantly asexually, giving birth to live offspring. They have around 15 generations in a season. Then as the season shortens they, um, and the day length shortens, they produce sexual individuals. And they do this by losing one copy of their X chromosome. So they have this XX, XO sex determination system. Uh, females have two copies of the X chromosome and males only have a single copy of the X chromosome. They then, um, during um, spermatogenesis, um, all sperm which don't copy, carry a copy of the X chromosome are eliminated, which means that after mating, all the, they, they produce these overwintering eggs, which then hatch out in the spring, but all these eggs, because they've lost any sperm without an X chromosome, all these X eggs then hatch out into all female offspring again and restart the cycle again as asexual females. And there's a bunch of interesting stuff that we don't really understand at all with this process. So we don't know how these X chromosomes are eliminated. We, um, we don't know anything about how um, they compensate for only having a single copy of the X chromosome in males. So how dosage compensation might work, how they equalize their expression in males and females. And we don't know how these AO gametes are, are identified. They also have this weird um, genome architecture as well. So as I mentioned before, they have holocentric chromosomes which don't have localized centromeres. And what, what classical cytogenetics has shown is that um, heterochromatin, the highly densely packed repetitive regions of the genome, are localized on the X, predominantly on the X chromosome. And you see these typical bands of heterochromatin across the X chromosome, um, but not on the autosomes, apart from some regions at the telomeres. And there's also on the X chromosomes, you find these very GC rich regions, which contain big uh, tracts of ribosomal RNA genes as well. So they have this interesting genome architecture. And if we want to understand all these processes and, and what's going on in, in aphid chromosome evolution, we need high quality genome assemblies. And that's what we've started to generate. So we've been using a combination of nanopore long read sequencing and 10x genomics linked reads. And we've been combining that with in vivo uh, chromatin confirmation capture data, high C data, to scaffold these uh, our de novo assemblies into, into chromosome length molecules. And today I'm going to present two assemblies that we generated recently. This is one of the, the green peach aphid, Mises persicae, which has a diploid chromosome number of 12, so six chromosomes, and uh, the pea aphid, which is a, a model aphid species which has a, a diploid chromosome number of eight, so it has four chromosomes. And we've also made use of, a of, of another high quality genome assembly that's recently been released from George Jander's lab of the corn leaf aphid. Um, this is a, a high coverage bio plus high C assembly with very high contiguity, which we've been using as well in some of our analysis. And this gives us three aphids to compare. And what I want to do in the remainder of the talk is take you on something of a, a whistle stop tour of aphid genome evolution. So first I'm going to orientate you with the genomes that we're looking at. So this is a phylogeny of Hemiptera with sequenced genomes. The aphids are at the top here. Uh, sorry, seven or eight aphid species here with sequenced genomes. And this is calibrated by time. So here we've got Mises persicae at the top, the green peach aphid, and apisum, the, the pea aphid, they diverged about 22 million years ago. And then the corn leaf aphid, which belongs to the second tribe, aphidini, diverged about 30 million years ago. And overall, uh, Hemiptera are an ancient group which diverged around three to 400 million years ago. And we may use, we've, what I want to do is first talk briefly about these assemblies of Mises persicae and, and pea aphid. I'll then go on to take a first look at syntony. Uh, between these within aphids uh, between these three genomes and then zoom out to look at syntony in the blood-sucking hemipterans. So these are uh, members of heteroptera uh, and a couple of high quality assemblies have recently become available which we can use to compare with our aphid assemblies. Okay so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about the assemblies but uh, the, there's a links to the preprint for this work are available on the Slack channel and also I'd like to highlight uh, two protocols that we've recently wrote, written up. These were led by Roland Wouters and Sam Mugford at the John Innes Centre. 
um, one on uh, extracting high molecular weight DNA from aphids for long read sequencing and another on extracting DNA, high quality DNA from very tiny insects like aphids, individual tiny insects like aphids. So please take a look at these if you're interested in any of these uh, methods. So we, we generated this high quality assembly of Mises persicae. Here I've shown on the, this, this side of the screen, the high C contact map, which shows contacts between uh, high C molecule, um, contact between um, high C molecules, uh, which basically describe the, the, um, the, the proximity of, of sequences to each other in the genome. Um, and here in blue, I'm showing super scaffolds, which correspond to chromosomes. And in green, you can see individual contigs from our nanopore assembly. So we achieved a contigy of four megabases with contigs up to nearly 20 megabases, so spanning quite large chunks of chromosomes. And we managed to scaffold 97% of the assembly into six chromosomes, which is the expected karyotype for Mises persicae. And given this high quality assembly, we were also looking for some interesting features of aphid genome. So um, we know it, so there's some older work which has shown that specific satellite DNAs are associated with the X chromosome in these very heterochromatic regions of the X chromosome. And we thought we might be able to find some of these in our high quality nanopore assembly. So we had a look for this HIN200 sequence, which has been um, mapped in, in, in Mises persicae before. And indeed, we find this uh, located on scaffold one, which is our X chromosome here in four bands. Four minutes. We also, great. So we also generated an assembly of the P aphid, which is a larger genome, 500 megabases. It doesn't assemble quite as well, uh, 500 KB N50. Uh, we used some 10X data to scaffold this and then subsequently scaffold it with high C data into four chromosomes, which, co which contain 98% of the genome assembly. Uh, this, I'll skip over this, but it's, it's more repetitive than the than, than Mises persicae. We were able to identify the X chromosome in these assemblies using uh, patterns of coverage across the genome in males and females. As I mentioned before, males have a single copy of the X chromosome, females have two copies, and we have some sequence data from male and female Mises persicae. And from previously published work on PA feed, we also have male and female sequence data. So we mapped these reads and compared the ratio of male to asexual female coverage across the genome in windows and we see that the scaffold one in both assemblies corresponds to the X chromosome where it has approximately half the coverage of the autosomes uh, in males to females. Okay so we can now use these assemblies to have a quick look at syntony within aphids. So we did this with, and compared our three aphid species, Mises persicae, Armadis and Apisum. Uh, and here there's uh, each assembly is around the edge of this circle and lines link um, orthologous genes located within syntony blocks. And this striking pattern jumped out us immediately where we find that the autosomes have lots of rearrangements between chromosomes, whereas but we see the X chromosomes of each species. So chromosome one of Mises persicae, chromosome one of P. aphid, and chromosome three of Armadis all have links within to each other, but not to other autosomes in other species, indicating a lack of genomic rearrangements on the X chromosome. And we can look at this in a bit more detail if we zoom in. So here is a comparison between Mises persicae at the top and Apisum at the bottom, the P aphid. And here we see again the, the X chromosome, which is, is conserved between Mises persicae and Apisum. But then we see the lots of rearrangements going on on the autosomes. So you can see some pretty typical examples here, of either chromosome fusion or fission events between here, for example, chromosome four and chromosome five of Mises persicae and chromosome three of the P aphid. And then if we zoom out to this more divergent comparison of Mises persicae and Armadis, this corn leaf aphid from this other aphid tribe, which diverged about 32 million years ago, we again see the conservation of the X chromosome, but the autosomes are completely shuffled. And this is shuffled to the extent that we don't really see homology between chromosomes at all anymore. So there's a really high rate of genome rearrangement. And we, propose, we speculate that there's likely strong selection against rearrangements involving the X chromosome, given this background of high rearrangement rates on the autosomes. We can pull in these other assemblies from other hemitra. Uh, I'll just be quick, Rob, um, and uh, to look at whether this is a typical trait of aphids or whether it's found across hemiptera. So there's two publicly available chromosome assemblies of heteroptera, um, these two blood feeding species, and we asked whether the X chromosome was conserved and whether we see the same high rates of rearrangement. And we find that the uh, Rodneus X chromosome maps to the 
X chromosome as the, as the aphid, but also two other chromosomes, uh, chromosome five and chromosome seven of, uh, of Rodney's mapped to the aphid X chromosome. So there's possibly been uh, an ancient chromosome fusion or fission event in either of the two lineages. And finally, we compared rearrangement rates. So here we've got these um, rearrangements within aphids mapped to the phylogeny, uh, which we see this very high rate of autosomal rearrangement. And then if we compare it to what's going on, these blue heteroptera. You need to wrap up. Right at the end there. Um, so we see very high syntony, essentially, with, no, with very few rearrangements, apart from a split in the X chromosome in Rodneus. So this uh, gives us many new exciting questions, um, which we can ask about aphid genomes. And I'll just finish there because I'm slightly over. Apologies for that. And just highlight that I'm funded by the BBSRC. I'm based in Saskia Hogan House Lab at JIC, and a whole bunch of people have helped us with all these uh, cool assemblies and analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. One quick question that you're allowed to answer with a yes or no only because we're okay. over time. Uh, have you been able to link any particular selective advantage to a particular genome rearrangement event? Yeah, I think uh, no. Uh, no answer, yes, yes or no? <laughs> Not yes. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you can uh, extrapolate on that in the Slack uh, later. Yeah, great. Thank I, you yeah, very I'm much. happy to chat with people if they're interested. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, Surya. All right, um, great. So uh, just a reminder to all attendees, please use the Q&A to post your questions. If we, since we don't have time to address them right after the talk, we will try to address them at the end of the session and we will continue discussions on Slack. So please don't remember to post your questions. Um, and next uh, we have Igor, uh, who's gonna talk about uh, mosquito genomes. So uh, I will be talking about uh, three-dimensional genome organization in malaria mosquitoes. So basically, uh, we're interested in understanding uh, genomic, uh, genomic interactions in three-dimensional space, because this interaction, that's what gives uh, function. Without this interaction, uh, there are uh, problems with the gene expression and uh, also some developmental abnormalities. So uh, the, clo the closest species to mosquitoes for which uh, this uh, three-dimensional organization of the genome has been studied is, the, of course, Drosophila. And uh, people used con uh, chromosome confirmation capture methods such as HiC to understand how genome is organized. It turns out this is hierarchical organization. Uh, first, we can see chromosomal territories. They have uh, centromere and telomeric clustering at opposite poles of the nucleus, representing rubble-like orientation. Also, the chromosomal territories themselves uh, consist of compartments. B compartments are inactive compartments, and A compartments consist of active uh, domains. So th these domains uh, are called topologically associated domains, or TADs, which uh, in turn consist of series of loops and TADs, uh, basically believed to be uh, functional units of the genome or transcriptional units, and they uh, bring together uh, genes and regulatory regions, and they are delineated by architectural proteins. Within the TADs, loops are formed, bringing together enhancer and promoters, thus regulating gene function. None of that information exists for mosquitoes, so we decided to fill this gap. What we did before, we used oligopanes to study chromosomal territories, but this is just the highest level of that hierarchy. And we found that, uh, like in Drosophila, chromosomal territories in mosquitoes have rubble-like con uh, rubble -like configuration. Uh, the chromosomal territories interact in cell type specific manner. And also we found that the X chromosome is more highly compacted than autosomes. And I will be talking about a, li a little bit later. So basically the re research questions we ask were, how do different uh, types of genomic re contacts are realized at different levels of chromatin architecture? And are chromatin interactions conserved in the evolution of genus Anopheles? So based on these questions, we developed 
uh, our project such in a way that uh, we have uh, the whole phylogeny of mosquito species uh, with a maximum divergence of 100 million years and with a minimal divergence of 0 0.5 million. So we can look at uh, evolution of the three-dimensional organization. We used uh, uh, embryos for high C and uh, obtained these typical high C maps where we can study uh, different layers of that uh, hierarchy. Uh, so genome assemblies we use for this uh, high C scaffoldings are basically available at vector base, except for Anopheles merus, uh, we developed a pack bio assembly in this study in collaboration with Rob Waterhouse group and JEC2 group. So this is a representative high C contact map. In this case, it's Anopheles albimanus. What you can see is already on high C map, you can see the chromosomal territories, X, 2R, 2L, 3L, and 3R. And uh, you can also see the interactions, for example, in the centromere centromere clustering, in gray circles and telomere telomere clustering and represented by uh, yellow circles. And you can see this kind of wings, that's interaction between right and left arms. This uh, suggests rubble orientation. And if you zoom in at the one of the diagonal, you can see com compartments a and B compartments, and which one is which you can tell based on high uh, RNA seq profile. Of course, A compartments, active compartments, and B compartments are inactive compartments. So these squares belong to different types. These compartments basically interactions between TATs, and TATs can be visualized here using sp special software. And within the TATs, we also can see loops, and you can recognize loops by this. Uh, bright spots representing loop anchors. So to validate whether this rubble orientation exi exists, we used FISH, where we labeled syndromic probes for autosome and X chromosome to see if they colocalize in the nuclear periphery, and they indeed do colocalize, more so in follicular cells. There is a colocalization of autosomal and X chromosome probes, satellites with heterochromatin, and to the lesser extent in the nerve cells where polyton chromosomes exist. Two minutes, Igor. We were interested in rearrangements and we've confirmed the previous study that uh, X chromosome has faster rate of rearrangement. What is interesting, uh, this is also, uh, we found that X chromosome has less uh, insula in insulation between the TATs, as indicated in this graph, indicating that there is more interaction between different TATs in X chromosome. That's uh, ag in agreement with higher competition rate. In addition, uh, we found uh, one interesting feature as a concert long range interactions uh, uh, within chromosomes. These are quite huge interactions. The largest is 31 megabases apart. Those uh, loci can interact and they are conserved. One and, minute, Igor. Yeah, we looked at uh, the uh, epigenetic profile. Some of them have uh, HCK27 methyl 3 marks, but some don't. So that can be different nature of those interactions. And we confirm that they indeed uh, interact by 3D fish. In conclusion, we obtained high level chromosomal assemblies. We confirm rubble configuration. We identified all this hierarchy that can be seen in the zoophile as well. But in addition, we found some interesting features such as high competition of the X chromosome and uh, high interaction between neighboring TATs, as well as we found interesting concert long range interactions that most of them are not polycom based. And this is collaborative work in, uh, with uh, researchers from Virginia Tech, Institute of Cytology and Genetics, and University of Lausanne. 
So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Igor. Those, uh, that ancient conservation of those inter interactions is really uh, amazing. Uh, in the interest of time, though, I think um, we'll have to leave the further discussion to the Slack afterwards. So please go ahead, Surya. All right. Um, let's uh, welcome JJ Emerson, who's going to talk about uh, genome structure and function in Drosophila. Next. Okay. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Let me see your screen. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, oh, pardon me. That's in the middle of the presentation. Uh, let's go all the way to the beginning. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'd like to thank the organizers not only for inviting me, um, it's always nice to be thought of, but for doing such a good job in organizing this. These uh, virtual conferences um, have been rough starting out because we're all new to them, and this has been really amazing, and I'm, I really thank you for uh, such a good uh, job in organizing. So today I'd like to talk to you about work that we've been doing in my lab probably for about five years, um, ever since the uh, PacBio P5C3 uh, uh, library uh, prep came out um, on the old RS2 machine. Um, and we're, I'm going to tell you a little bit about evolution of genome structure and function in Drosophila. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is uh, um, let anybody know that if you'd like to share this or talk about it or take screenshots or whatever, you're more than welcome to. Um, okay, so a brief overview of my talk. Um, I am very interested in uh, structural variation and um, in the arthropod genomics uh, uh, meeting. Of course, a lot of people are interested in this as well, um, so probably this audience doesn't need as much of an introduction as most do. Um, but we are interested in genome assembly primarily uh, because we like to discover uh, structural variants. And um, so first I'm going to do a very brief overview of what I mean when I talk about structural variation because we've just talked about 3D chromosome structure and things like that, so there may be some ambiguity. Um, then I will sort of go very briefly over what uh, how the recent advances make studying structural, vari uh, structural variation very tractable. And then, because I am really well placed in the symposium um, that everyone's given all the introductory material I would have given, I'm just going to go on a kind of a little, a very short uh, grab bag of what it is that we've discovered in both relatively short and uh, medium uh, evolutionary timescales. So first of all, when I talk about structural variation, what do I mean? Well, um, I love this example because this is uh, an example from uh, Drosophila melanogaster on, um, on uh, an insecticide resistance gene called uh, Cytochrome P450 uh, family member G1. And it's got this beautiful example of where you have a nice uh, insecticide resistance gene in one allele in, in Drosophila melanogaster and then a duplication, which contains a transposal element um, in front of both copies. Presumably there's also a copy, at least in the historic past, that uh, showed only a single TE because this is copied. Then another TE jumps inside the first TE, and then finally you have yet another TE jumping inside the other copy. And so these are just a handful of different alleles that you can find, and this uh, includes some of the most important types of structural variants, including uh, copy number variants or duplications, especially gene duplications, and transposable elements. Of course, there are also inversions and uh, fissions and fusions and things like that, um, and we're interested in those as well. So, um, as we've seen throughout the conference in the last couple of years, high quality genome assembly is accessible, and it's actually, uh, uh, we can get quite high quality assemblies, and to determine, to, in order to discover these types of mutations, this is actually an essential step. Um, in our lab, um, we've been using this process where we try to um, combine information from multiple assemblies. So I'm just going to, we use this extensively throughout our work, so I'm just going to introduce it uh, real quick here. But there's this observation that whenever you try to do an assembly, let's say follow this path here, you start with your fly, you do your DNA extraction, and you get some sort of uh, sequencing library, and then you'll come up with this branch point. You say, well, I'll use canoe, and you find a good assembly, but then you also say, well, maybe I'll use Falcon, or maybe IPA, or some other appropriate assembler, and you say, well, wow, these things are different. They have complementary information. And so um, a few years ago, we thought, well, why can't we just have our cake and eat it too? And so a postdoc um, uh, who uh, collaborates with me in our lab, um, Mahul Chakraborty um, and a PhD student in Tony Long's group developed this meta assembler. And so now we can take the same data set, maybe use two assemblers, and we found that it works quite well to increase the contiguity and it doesn't really sacrifice much. Um, 
we also found that it, does, it works pretty well whenever you try to combine two different technologies. And so um, you can take, say, Oxford Nanopore and PacBio, and you can take the two different uh, data and you can combine them. And what's really interesting about this is that it seems to be able to um, take relatively modest, at least from my perspective, you know, megabase in fit, uh, uh, contig in 50 of maybe one or two megabases and can combine it into um, whole chromosome arm level contiguity. Okay, so um, what do we do with, uh, with these assemblies? So first of all, I'm going to show you um, what these assemblies permit us to do. So um, thanks to Fringy for introducing this earlier. This is the Earth Biogenome Project uh, categorization where on the x-axis you have a log scale for contig in 50 and on the y-axis you have a scaffold in 50 scale. And what you have here is this category 4, um, which is anywhere from 10 to 100 megabases. And I just like to show this not for any particular reason, then we can have a lot of mosquito assemblies that are out there. I'm just showing that these are pretty good mosquito assemblies. These are really actually quite good. I think some of these are actually from Igor's talk just a, a few minutes ago, and um, uh, at least the basis of the assemblies, of course. And so you see extremely high long range contiguity, but if they weren't made with long molecule sequencing, um, then, um, then they don't have very high contig contiguity. So, and of course, you know, some of the older assemblies that people haven't worked on recently have, you know, low for both. And what um, things like long molecule sequencing and high C have permitted us to do is achieve something like this. And this is a recent assembly that we've done in um, our lab. Um, and um, this will be, um, Mahul Chakraborty will talk about this assembly later in the conference. Now, um, one of the things uh, that I'm going to focus on here is just Drosophila. So um, this is the uh, Anopheles Stevens that I just talked about, and this is the human uh, genome. And this is a very thick region with a lot of Drosophila species, um, very closely related to Melanogaster. And this right here is Drosophila pseudo-obscura. And so um, I have collapsed all of Drosophila into just a polygon that contains all the assemblies that we've done in our lab and in collaboration with Tony Long. And this is the Drosophila melanogaster species complex. Uh, currently we have um, about 20 assemblies in this region, including all four members of the species complex. And um, as I said before, if you're interested in a little bit of what we've been doing with uh, long molecule sequencing in high C, Mahul Chakraborty will give a talk in section six on July the 23rd. Okay, so I'm not gonna go over the methods, but if you're interested in them, there are two papers that describe how we do this. Um, and I will put this talk up later so that you can look at it. I'm not going to um, uh, spend more time on that. So anyway, um, finally, I'm gonna move on to uh, structural variation between Drosophila species in the last two minutes. Um, and first of all, I wanna make sure this is a really big collaboration and I wanna make sure that I acknowledge everyone here. Um, and this includes this uh, very diverse group of many people, but especially these two guys right here. Um, and today I'm going to do a quick little overview of what we found with these high quality assemblies. I'm gonna first start with the Drosophila melanogaster species complex, and then I'll move on to Drosophila pseudo obscura. And there are two stories, these closely related species, I'm gonna talk about how much they change, and with this more distantly related species to, uh, to Drosophila Lenexter, I'm going to talk about how much it stayed the same. So just as a quick orientation, there are three species here that are essentially form a hard trichotomy because of uh, incomplete lineage sorting, and they're very closely related, as you can see down here, and they're not too distantly related from Drosophila melanogaster. Um, classic studies in the early part of the genomic era have shown that about 5% uh, medium divergence in 50 kb windows between these species. So the first thing I wanna say, which is really surprising to me, is that if we draw a line right here at 5%, this is what we've observed before. If we take these high quality assemblies that I just showed you, and we look at substitutions between the aligned portions, we find that it's maybe a little bit more 2%. But if we take the whole region that's not aligned, we find that it's actually double what we found in the aligned uh, uh, regions. And so what this leads you to conclude is that if we're thinking, what is conservation? It's the amount of genomes that are, uh, amount of the genome that's shared between the species. Well, what we see here is that it's more than three times the amount that we usually talk about when we just talk about, oh, it's 5% diverged between each other. They're at least 20% divergent if you talk about genome content, which I thought was quite shocking. Um, if we move on, I just want to show one nice little thing that you can do. Um, I probably won't have time to go into this in great detail, but find lots of hidden uh, duplicates. This is one of my favorites. It's maternal haploid. It's a hidden duplication on the X chromosome that has gained male function. Um, the second copy um, is now extremely male biased. This is a ratio of the two duplicates. When it's low, it's uh, male. 
when it's high, it's female. This is the ancestral version. Okay, um, coming in on the home stretch, um, I won't have a lot of time to get into Drosophila pseudo-obscura, but I do want to uh, um, go ahead and uh, let you know if you're interested. I'll upload the slides, and you're more than happy to look at this and take a look at the preprint. Um, we used high C uh, as uh, Igor Sherikov just uh, uh, outlined, and we found uh, conserved regions between Drosophila pseudo-obscura and Drosophila melanogaster, and um, I think I'm going to be responsible here and stop right now, but I would like to uh, say that we find a remarkable amount of conservation of these topologically associating domains, despite the shattered uh, local synteny across chromosomes through all the rearrangement over time. So this is how much rearrangement we have, and we actually see a pretty large excess of TAD conservation. Um, I only had one more story, but I'm going to stop there, um, and I want to thank you for your time. Thanks, JJ. Uh, yes, we do need to move on. So uh, don't worry, there's still the 15 minutes at the end where we can uh, pose the questions to each of the speakers. Um, but now we have uh, three uh, short talks and we want to give them the full chance to uh, present. All right, and starting with Craig Jackson, who's going to talk about uh, Daphnean genomes. Can you see the screen okay? Yes. All right, um, great. We, we see the present of you. How about now? Yes, thank you. All right, I'm going to talk about uh, chromosome rearrangements and adaptive divergence in Daphnia. So Daphnia are a small freshwater crustacean found worldwide, but my, my research today is focusing on two closely related uh, North American sister Daphnia species, uh, Pulicaria and Pulax. Um, these two species have adapted to live in different environments with Pulicaria um, inhabiting permanent lakes and Pulax in temporary uh, seasonal ponds. Uh, and contrasting selective pressures in these habitats have resulted in the species having very different life history and ecological traits. Um, in order to uncover the complete evolutionary history of this Daphnia ecological speciation, I've used an integrated comparative genomics approach that combines uh, demographic modeling, population genetics, functional genomics, and chromosome synteny. Um, due to time constraints, I'm just briefly going to go over these, but I mostly want to focus on the genome structure. And uh, the results of this research, as we've talked about, would not have been possible without uh, new chromosome scale genome assemblies um, using uh, PacBio and uh, Dovetail chromosome confirmation, which has opened new avenues for analyses. Um, we sequenced Daphnia from across North America. Um, we see Pulicaria in blue and Pulex populations in red to capture the species-wide genetic variation across the continent. And uh, this metapopulation study allows us to investigate the complete genetic variation across both species in chromosome space using the new uh, chromosome scale assemblies. Um, with this cross-species variation, um, we used maximum likelihood demographic models to infer the history of speciation. We tested seven different modes of speciation um, and found that the genetic data best fit with the secondary contact model where the two species were initially isolated, followed by a period of gene flow between the two species. Um, we also found that these timings uh, corresponded um, with North American glaciation history that have heavily influenced the Daphne habitats that I mentioned. We can also view this cross-species variation on the genome landscape um, and measure genetic differ differentiation uh, shown here on chromosome 2. We can look at differ differentiation looking at all of the cross-species variation with uh, lower values indicating little species differences and higher values indicating more species difference. Um, in addition, we can also the measure the amount of completely fixed differences between the two species in genome space. And when we view this on the um, entire chromosome um, assembly here, you see Daphne has 12 chromosomes. Um, we see that large contiguous regions of preserved divergence appear. They're highlighted in yellow here. Um, and they encompass over one third of the genome, while the rest of the genome, not in yellow, 
um, has been homogenized due to gene flow between the two species. Um, we can see almost all of the fixed differences between the two species lie in these portions of the genome while the rest of the genome is devoid of uh, any fixed difference. Um, in addition, we also identified over 150 candidate genes under selection throughout these divergent regions. They're um, indicated in the fuchsia markings here. Um, we found that many of these genes functions correspond to the different ecological traits between the species um, that I mentioned, um, indicating that we see adaptive divergence within some of these regions. Uh, next, we use, using the chromosome scale assemblies, we were able to view the complete contiguous genome alignments between the two species. Uh, here we have the Pulicaria um, 12 chromosomes on the X and uh, Daphne Pulex uh, genome. And we see the, the main diagonal shows collinear genome regions and any deviations um, indicate um, chromosome rearrangements. And in yellow are the um, divergence regions that I mentioned before. Uh, we found numerous inversions and translocations between the two genomes, um, but what we found is that almost all of the genomic divergent regions are associated with uh, chromosome rearrangements in those, at those loci. Um, for instance, here on chromosome four, um, I, can, I will zoom in and focus on uh, chromosome four. Uh, we see that it is a a large divergence region that contains uh, both translocations and nested inversions and captures tw uh, 12 of the adaptive genes we identified. Um, you can see the divergence um, statistics here with our, with our inversions. And you can see if we were to lay these chromosomes out, they would be um, very different. In addition, we used a chromosome-wide uh, linkage disequilibrium. You're about to wrap up, Craig? Yep. Um, uh, so here we see the LD patterns indicate that these rearrangement haplotypes rose to fixation or as main as polymorphic variants. Um, and, and wrapping up, uh, we see that chromosome rearrangements suppress recombination. And during cross-species migration, these rearrangements would suppress gene flow. Um, these rearrangements that capture and ecologically favored alleles are therefore beneficial. So altogether, um, I wanted to show that we've seen that these rearrangements have preserved the adaptive divergence um, in the Daphnia ecological speciation. Thank you. So right, without further ado, because we are, we are running over, let's just uh, straight go on over to YY's presentation on the AFIDX chromosome. Yes, we can see the slides. Perfect, thank you. Um, oh, okay, can everyone yes, hear me now? Yes, now. Right. Thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for having me here and really like to thank the organizers for the symposium. I really enjoyed it so far. Um, and today I'm going to talk about, like the title say, the, the AFID X chromosome is a dangerous place for important functional genes. Um, yeah, so as Tom mentioned earlier, um, the AFID is a great system for understanding the chromosome, uh, chromosome level evolution, um, and especially their a unique life cycle of the AFID that uh, most of the, their generation is made of the asexual reproduction, and then the males is only like a tiny little part of their life cycle. And based on Jackery et al, um, extensive studies and theoretical models, they found that the X chromosome is enriched with male bias genes. And then the X chromosome is evolving fast um, compared to the other genes, uh, other chromosomes. And then they found out it could be due to the relaxed purifying selection on the male bias genes. Um, however, previous studies are all based on the, um, uh, without a chromosome level genome assembly. So, uh, so in our study, we built the chromosome level genome study, a genome of the aphid and the close related species that without this asexual phase, which is a psyllid. So compare aphid with psyllid, um, they both have this XO6 determination system. And then aphid has this asexual phase, they're cyclic pathogenetic, whereas psyllids, they're obligate sexual. They have similar genome size. Um, aphids has three chromosomes, three autosomes, one X chromosome, and psyllid has a little more uh, autosomes. 
um, and they both harbor this obligate Indosimbaya, Bucnera apicola, and then Carcinella rudi, and they are hosted in a specialized cells called uh, bacteriocytes. Um, so for our approach, um, uh, as I just mentioned, we made this chromosome level genome assembly of the Hackberry patio gall fillet, um, and then the PAL4 strain using high C technology. Uh, and then we can also compare the PAFA genome with other available chromosome level genome assemblies. And then to understand those um, important functional genes, we use the RNA-seq on male, female individuals, and then the bacteriocytes, and then the whole body, um, in the idea that if the genes highly expressed, they're important genes. Um, so first we compared the PAFA genome uh, with the uh, corn leaf. Uh, genome as uh, synteny between autosomes and X chromosome. We also found that. And also, um, however, between aphid and psyllid only found a one uh, small synteny between the X chromosome and the autosome, uh, which indicated they don't really share much synteny between uh, their uh, uh, genomes. Um, and then we mapped those um, uh, Import, functional important genes uh, based on the RNA-seq data. So we identified male bias genes, uh, sexual female bias genes, asexual female bias genes, and also bacterial related genes. And so we found in aphids, the male bias genes are enriched on the X chromosome, as well as the unexpressed genes. Uh, however, for all the other categories, they are enriched on the autosomes. And in the psyllid, we didn't really see that pattern. Um, all different gene categories are uh, pretty uh, consistent with the genome average, except the male bias genes is slightly biased towards the autosomes. So th these two species show the opposite pattern. And then we look into their selection, the selection on different gene, uh, different chromosomes. So for psyllid, for aphid, we found the autosomes have lower DNDS ratio um, than the, uh, the X chromosome, which indicate the X chromosome is under relaxed purifying selection. And then for psyllid, we see the opposite pattern that the X chromosome has lower DNDS ratio. And lastly, we look at the level of gene expression. Um, as consistent with the previous RNA-seq data, the X chromosome overall has really low level of gene expression in AFIT. Um, um, however, in psyllid, we didn't really see this significant difference between autosomes and X chromosomes. Um, so in just summary here, um, for the aphid X chromosome, we found that it's under relaxed purifying selection and has lower level of gene expression consistent with previous theoretical model, but we proved it with the chromosome level genome assembly. We also found that aphid uh, functional important genes are enriched on the autosomes, uh, as I mentioned, like the bacteriocyte related genes or those genes um, that's um, it highly expressed in females. Um, however, on the other hand, the male beneficial genes are enriched on the X chromosome and uh, could be due to the rare, rare male phase in the aphid life cycle. Um, and I only have like five minutes, so if you're interested in our research, it's um, already online, and then the cellular genome is also public available. Um, with that, I'd like to take any questions. All right, uh, we will uh, keep the questions for the Q&A se session, which will start in just a few minutes. Uh, let's just move on over to Andrew Monk's talk. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Good, all right. So. And we can see the screen. See, okay, cool. All right, yeah. So I'll try and keep this quick because um, I know we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, so. As I'm going quickly, if you want to screen cap slides to refer back to for questions, that's fine. Or there's a preprint version of this up on the preprint channel of Slack. So um, thanks for the chance to let me talk about sex chromosomes in butterflies and moths today. And I had a sort of nice introduction from all the other talks so far, but quickly. Um, butterflies and moths use the ZZZW sex determining system for the most part in which males have two copies of a Z chromosome and females have one Z and one W chromosome. There are two key features here that I want to point out. First, um, populations have fewer Z chromosomes than a given autosome because females only have the one Z for each pair of autosomes. Second, again, because females only have the one Z 
any genes expressed on the Zn females are necessarily expressed in a haploid state. So population genetics tells us that this should have opposing effects, that smaller populations have increased genetic drift, but that haploid expression and therefore haploid selection is much more efficient than diploid selection. So depending on which of these two forces is more powerful, we might expect that the amount of adaptive evolution, alpha here, is either decreased on the Z chromosome relative to the autosomes, or it's increased on the Z relative to the autosomes. But in either case, theory predicts that the rate of molecular change, DNDS, should be higher for the Z chromosome than the autosomes. This is known as a faster Z effect. And again, if haploid selection drives more adaptation, a more adaptive Z effect. But when we look at the evidence to date in butterflies and moths, we see that there's really little consistency uh, for either of these predictions, but we've only sampled four species so far. And so today I'm gonna add another two, Manduca sexta, the Carolina um, sphinx moth, and Danis plexpus, the monarch butterfly, and try and get at what uh, some more insights into what's happening with sex chromosomes in Lepidoptera. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna skip a lot of the methodology, but this is using existing assemblies and resequencing data. And monarchs in particular are an interesting test case for us because they have neosex chromosomes. So their Z chromosome is made up of what I'll call an, the ancestral portion, which is basically the Z chromosome in most other butterflies and moths with the addition of this section of DNA that was previously autosomal, but became Z-linked thanks to a fusion between the Z and an autosome in the genus containing monarchs. And the cool thing about this is that the ancestral Z is full of male bias genes that are expressed in a diploid state in males only, but the Neo-Z is home to a lot of female bias genes, as well as those unbiased genes that are expressed in both males and females. And so if haploid expression drives adaptive evolution, it should be really apparent on the Neo-Z. Like I said, skipping methods for time here, jumping right to results, we see evidence for a faster Z in both species, Manduca and Danis, uh, but in Danis, it is that Neo-Z that I just described that has faster evolution than the autosomes. The ancestral portion of the Z chromosome is not actually faster than the autosomes. Likewise, uh, looking at adaptive evolution, we see evidence for more adaptive evolution on the Z chromosome than autosomes in both species. And in both species, it's these unbiased genes expressed again in both sexes that show more adaptive evolution. But in addition to this, in monarchs, the Neo-Z appears to be a hotspot for adaptive evolution of female bias genes as well consistent with this idea that haploid expression can drive adaptive evolution here on the sex chromosomes. So putting this all back together with the existing results, we see much more uh, consistency for an adaptive Z across Lepidoptera than was previously apparent. But evidence for the fast Z is still pretty weak. And I have um, a number of ideas of why that might be, but not a lot of time. So Feel free to ask more about that in questions. One idea though is that it might be that we're seeing lineage specific effects because more closely related species tend to have more similar sex chromosome evolution as you can see here. So um, to keep this short and wrap up, the last thing I wanna hit on is this idea of sex chromosome fusions because over and over again in Lepidoptera, we see independent origins of neosex chromosomes. And I think our monarch Neo-Z data shows that we can perhaps partly explain this by the fact that when a sex chromosome fuses with an autosome, you suddenly get this previously diploid um, set of genes that are now expressed at least sometimes in the haploid state, and that can lead to more adaptive evolution and potentially the fixation of these neosex chromosomes. So um, with thanks to my current lab, the Ross lab, for letting me talk about my 
work from my previous lab, the Walters lab, um, I'll wrap it up and we can move on to questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes at least scheduled for questions now. And I'd like to start with one that came up for YY, um, which is uh, what is your definition or what is the definition that you are using for an important functional gene as opposed to an unimportant gene? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so for the talk, because the time was kind of short, so I only talked about like those genes that we detected using like RNA-seq data and then like between male, female, or between like whole body versus bactericides and those genes that's like significantly upregulated in certain tissues, then we say that's the uh, important genes to certain function. Like if it's significantly upregulated in like bactericide, then we think those genes are important for regulating the bacteria. Uh, bactericides. Um, and then in the paper, we also look at like oxidative phosphorylation genes or um, those like ribosomal protein and genes. Those genes are like known to be like really conserved and really important. So also map those genes to the chromosome. Um, and also we see kind of similar bias. Okay, thank you. Um, a question now for Craig, and I guess uh, this uh, goes back to some of the methodology uh, yeah. questions that we were talking about earlier. All of these uh, wonderful inversion, inversions and rearrangements that you see, um, how can you know or how can you be convinced that they are not um, assembly artifacts? Um, so how one of the, and I wanted to address that right away in my research, one of the ways, um, this is why we did the metapopulation sequencing as well and looked at the leak, uh, linkage disequilibrium blocks throughout you know, the populations across the continent. Um, if we just look at the chromosome alignment, or I mean the, the assembly alignments, then you know, we can't be completely sure. But using the metapopulation, which is you know, sampling across the continent, we see these LD blocks that correspond exactly to the um, rearrangements that we see in the chromosome alignment. So we have not only the assembly evidence, but we have evidence from populations throughout the continent um, in the form of these LD blocks that, so that would address a little bit about the, just not just being assembly artifacts, but these are found throughout natural populations. Okay, so following up to that, another question, um, do you see, I mean, these, these, do you see these structural chromosomal differences within populations uh, of the same species? So I guess, you know, that's almost like in your confirmation, right? Yeah, so um, we see the ones we've identified, but as far as additional within species ones, we would need to do um, further, uh, you know, long read sequencing of these because we only have our, our, our one um, chromosome assembly for, for one uh, individual from each species and the population sequencing we did is all Illumina scale which we can try to do some structural um, variant calls with that but we're not going to get the resolution that we see um, using the long read um, and and um, uh, dovetail our high C stuff as well so that's a really great point and why not that it's great that this is getting a lot cheaper instead of just having one representative um, assembly we can start to do more of this long read stuff for um, individuals and whole populations. So I, I hope we can look at that in the future since these technologies are, are improving and getting cheaper. Yeah, certainly. Um, question for JJ uh, on your <clears throat> assembly reconciliation. So how does your assembly reconciliation work when you have assemblies that were generated with very different sequencing technologies? Um, we view that as an empirical question, um, and uh, so I can tell you what we've done. Our, our typical approach is to use melanogaster as a proving ground for anything we do. So we sequence everything in melanogaster, even though no one's interested in seeing the melanogaster sequence yet again. Um, but once we get the data, what we'll do is we'll apply the method, and then we'll check. Um, so far, we've gotten really good assemblies with both PacBio and Oxford Nanopore, and they are complementary, and so their merging will combine those complementary uh, results. Now, there is, um, in terms of the reconciliation for structural variants and large-scale chromosomal um, structure, um, I'm pretty confident that that's true, but uh, there are differences in error profiles and things like that. So 
um, depending on what generation you're using and what technology you have. If you're trying to combine platforms, say, use a slightly older Oxford Nanopore and you use Hi-Fi today, the Oxford Nanopore is going to give you a higher base level error rate, even after polishing. And so um, one of the things that we developed to kind of mitigate that is this double merging technique that allows you to use only the scaffolding information or the sort of order and orientation information if you do two rounds of assembly. There's a paper that we have that was published in G3 in uh, 2018 that describes that process. Um, and, and that tends to only leave the sort of maybe more error prone region um, as little as that as possible as part of your merged assembly. So um, if you want to do that, I'd be, uh, I'd be very careful about not just large scale, but also frame shifts and things like that. If you look at uh, um, uh, Terrence Murphy's talk, it's really important to deal with that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, thanks. Um, so we have another, a question for Igor here about the, the 3D genome structures. Um, from Jeff uh, Otardo, he's asking whether this um, 3D structure and localization of the chromosomes differs when you look at different tissue types. Yeah, and most of the aspects uh, are expected to be uh, conserved among tissues. But of course, because uh, gene expression differ between tissues, we expect to see the tissue-specific uh, contacts, uh, chromatin contacts. Uh, but we have not studied. What we did, we studied um, embryonic and adult for one of the species, Anopheles merus. So we did high C on uh, these two uh, different uh, sources. And we actually found that these long range interactions are preserved. They, they don't appear, they don't disappear. They stay during the whole life of the uh, mosquito. So at this point, uh, I cannot say any definitive since we have not studied different issues. Okay, so there's a, there's a hint there, but the sample size is still small, yeah. Okay, good. Um, question for Shana, uh, going back to the methodologies, did you use uh, other hi-fi assemblers to assemble your genomes? Um, was there a clear winner? Yes, we did. We tried IPA, HiCanoe, and hi-fi ASM, and hi-fi ASM was a clear winner. Um, it have, had about half as many contigs as the other assemblies, all about the same genome size. Um, it had the highest N50, so I think there might just be like one more link that the Hi-Fi ASM assembly made to put those contigs together over the other over the other assemblers. Okay, that's good to know, and I'm sure people will be uh, asking you on the Slack for more details there of your experience. Um, so maybe. Uh, Tom, you can elaborate on the very brief yes-no answer that I allowed you earlier on the selective advantage to uh, particular genome rearrangements. Yeah, so we haven't in terms of, because um, ob obviously at the minute we're dealing with quite still quite divergent species, so P. aphid and Mises perseca diverged 20 million years ago or, or more, um, and, and the other comparisons even, even more so, so we have to be a bit careful when we, we linking those sort of phenotypes or, or, um, or effects of these genome rearrangements. We haven't found anything uh, in terms of these big scale rearrangements yet, and, but we're, and we're sequencing more closely related individuals to, or species to try and zoom in on, on the ones which we can kind of get to. Um, but w in terms of individual genes and gene duplication events, we do see clear links. So we had a paper a few years ago showing duplications of specific cathepsin B genes, for example, are involved in host adjustment in Mises persicae. So we do know that small scale duplications and rearrangements are important functionally. And, and I, I would expect that some of these big rearrangements do have important roles, but we're, we're, we're not at a stage yet where, where we can really say what they are as yet, but we're working on it. Yeah. I mean, certainly in mosquitoes, you see these arrangements uh, lining up with uh, climatic uh, clines and things like that. Yeah. So there, there's, yeah, I, there's I think definitely something. Yeah, I think and as we get more population level, um, high quality assemblies as well, that will give more information. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, one last uh, question to be fair now to Andrew. Did I leave anyone out? No, I think I did. So, <laughs> so uh, for Andrew, um, is there any relationship between this uh, faster, sorry, I have to say Z, I can't say Z, uh, faster Z and the crazy um, dosage compensation difference between the Z and the near Z. 
Right. Yeah. Um, I, I just moved to Edinburgh and I, it hasn't caught on yet, but eventually I'll say Zen too. Um, yeah. So uh, for a little bit of background there, dosage compensation is different across our Z or Z chromosome with um, the ancestral part of the Z being downregulated in males, um, but the neo portion of the Z being upregulated in females. Uh, so there's definitely a clear distinction for the two halves of the chromosome, if you want to say, um, that does track with the difference in um, faster Z evolution. I don't know yet. I haven't thought clearly enough about uh, which direction causality goes there, um, but you can imagine that if you have these genes that came from autosomes that were previously diploid and are now haploid in females, um, you might want to upregulate them uh, to maintain um, the correct expression levels that the ancestrally had. Um, so there's that part. And then maybe coincidentally, Ali, also these are the um, female specific express genes, which are also fast evolving due to haploid selection. Okay, thanks. And we're right on time, but I'm going to ask Tom one question because I think uh, those of us who've been playing this game a long time might be kind of interested in this. Um, first aphid genome, 36,000 genes, all of us going, uh-uh, that can't be right. This looks a bit weird. Now you've done several more. Yeah. Do you believe it? Do you not believe it? What's normal for an aphid? So I think the only thing about aphids that's normal is that they're not, well, that they're not normal. But uh, there's, I, I think that um, depending on how you annotate the genomes, you, you always get a different number of genes. And it's, it's very hard to really reliably compare absolute gene numbers between all these different species. Um, I'm trying to build up a set of genomes which have been annotated using the same pipelines with the same sort of RNA-seq data, similar quality of a highly complete assemblies with little duplicated content. And from those assemblies and those annotations, I, st I see still very large variation in, in gene counts across aphids. So for example, that assembly that I presented of, of apism has got 31,000 genes, I think, annotated in it using um, a break, the Breaker 2 pipeline with RNA-seq data. Um, and that does tend to maybe slightly overestimate gene counts a bit compared to manually curated sets. Uh, but then this, the same pipeline with Mises persicae predicts 27,000, but we've done it on other species and it's as low as 20,000 or, or, or less. And I, I, there was a really nice paper in MBE recently um, look, uh, the, with a big phylogenomic analysis of aphids, and, and that was using annotations which were done in all different ways, but it showed that there's a, a big role of uh, gene loss in aphids. And in our original genome biology paper, we'd also found this comparing Mises and and P aphid, that there's, there was a, a burst of gene duplication early in aphid evolution. And then across aphid species, there's quite high differential loss rates of genes. So I think that's quite, if you can find those genes in multiple species, but then they're lost in some, but not others, that's quite good evidence that they're real, that some of those differences are real. Yeah, so, so I, as, we, as we sample more, we can become more confident, right? I think so, yeah. And, and I, I do think that there are quite substantial differences in gene counts across aphids. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So um, before handing over to Saria to uh, finish, um, <clears throat> there was a suggestion that after today's uh, double session, for those who are willing and able to hang around and have a further chat, we can launch uh, a Zoom meeting. Currently, I see like 26 likes on that suggestion on the Slack. It's in the uh, coming up next channel. Now, we all need a little break. Uh, so in about 10 or 15 minutes, I will uh, launch a meeting and I will post it on the coming up next channel for whoever is interested and available because we're all in different time zones. So it may not be um, perfectly suitable for everyone um, to have a little bit of a continuation of some of the discussions. Uh, all the speakers are of course welcome to join, but we understand if you have other things to do. Um, so give us 10, 15 minutes so we can all take a little breather and then uh, I will send the link uh, in the coming up next channel on the Slack. Uh, Saria, over to you. All right. Uh, I've already mentioned this in chat, but uh, the questions will be posted on the chat speaker sessions channel on Slack. 
Um, so please uh, keep on looking. Uh, this we are working across many different time zones. It's getting late for um, for uh, parts of the world. So some of the speakers may not have time to reply to the questions today. They will probably get it get to it as soon as possible in their time zone. But uh, those questions will be there. Um, otherwise, I would like to take a moment to um, thank all the speakers for keeping on time. We had a very tight schedule. I think they did a fantastic job of dealing with technical issues, being ready on time, and having a very tight uh, slide deck. So I would like to thank all the speakers. <laughs>